Have you ever had a mountaintop experience? Maybe last night. Uh, a moment where you say, it couldn't get any better than this. Eight years ago, nearly to the day, last weekend, my first child, my daughter, was born. We showed up at the hospital early in the morning. It was like 6 a.m. We get to the hospital. Uh, we, we, they wheel us into our room. My wife is in labor. And, and finally, around 11 o'clock that night, our first daughter is born, our first child. And uh, my wife was just totally exhausted. I don't, I don't really know why, but she was tired. And so and immediately the baby is born, and, and she, you know, gets to, gets to see her, little Charlotte. And, but then it's just exhausted. She's falling asleep. And so they hand me my daughter. And I look down at this perfect bloody red lizard. And, and I was just in love. I just knew this was my girl, and, and it was this incredible experience, this mountaintop, this, it couldn't get any better than this kind of moment. I, it couldn't get any better than this moment. Maybe it happened for you on a, on a field. Maybe it happened for you uh, at a band competition. Maybe it happened for you last night where you had this, this high, this experience where you thought this, nothing could be better than this. We stayed in the hospital for two days. And then they told us it was time to go home. And so I said, uh, okay, well, how many nurses are you going to send with us to, um, to, you know, you don't have to get a license to have a baby. You have to have a license to drive a car, but you, you, get, you have to have, you can just, anyone can have a baby. I went to all the classes before, and I didn't, how many of you had brothers and sisters growing up? Brothers and sisters? Like younger, but not just older, but younger. So you know what it's like to have a little human being around that you've got to keep alive, right? So I, I didn't have any younger siblings, and so before my daughter was born, I went to all the classes, and I learned, you know, how to change diapers and, and all the stuff you're supposed to do. I learned that you're not supposed to shake babies. Okay, now you laugh because you think, of course you don't shake babies, but when it's three in the morning, and this kid won't shut up, and you've changed the diaper, and, and the kid has eaten, and, and there is nothing wrong. The temperature is perfect, the world is perfect, and it's still screaming. You start to think, maybe I should just shake it. Like, maybe that will help. I know you shouldn't think that, but you do. I remember uh, little old ladies in our church uh, would, would come up to us, and, and I, would, I told people I was, you know, nervous about having this child, and they would come up to me, and they would say, you know, Tyler, don't worry. Sweet, lovely, little old ladies in our church, and they'd say, don't worry. You'll know what to do. And they're liars. Because I didn't know what to do. One night, uh, our daughter Charlotte got her first fever, and we didn't know what to do, and so we're calling the, the, the hotline number to the hospital, like, you know, what are we going to do? How do we keep this little person alive? And, and they say, you know, don't worry. As long as it stays under a certain temperature, she should be fine. Just keep an eye on it. Call us back if you need anything, which is totally unhelpful. And so we, we have to get, a, now we're like, oh, we need a thermometer. We got to figure out what her temperature is. And so my wife goes to the store. She doesn't know of the 17 different kinds of thermometers, which ones to buy. So she spends $100 on thermometers. We didn't know what to do. Did you know that babies, when they're born, they have like a soft spot on their head. It's basically a self-destruct button. And so in all of this, we go from this mountaintop experience of everything is great, everything is incredible. You know, they give us our baby and we're counting our fingers and toes a hundred times. And then really quickly we realize this is going to be a lot harder than we imagined. I don't know how we're going to do this. Because after the mountain, always comes the valley. And that's where we find Elijah this morning. You have your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 19. He's just had literally the mountaintop experience, Mount Carmel, right? He, he has witnessed God bring fire from heaven to, to get the sacrifice, to defeat the prophets of Baal, this incredible victory for God and God's prophet Elijah. The rain comes, and Elijah thinks it can't get any better than this. 1 Kings 19, verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how she had, or and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. Now there's, this word messenger is important. You might circle it in your Bible. Messenger, this is the Hebrew word malach, okay? The, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. 
say it with me, Malak. One more time, Malak. Okay, this is a messenger. And so Jezebel sends a messenger of death. So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Hey, Elijah, I know you killed my prophets. I know you killed the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah. And um, if by the end of the day you're not dead, then, uh, then I'll die too. She's giving him a message of death. And then, this, this is how messages of death work, just so you know, just so you can be ready, because I promise you that after this week, maybe this week, you're going to get a message of death. You've had a mountaintop experience, and then after the mountain is going to come the valley, and, and you're going to get a message of death. And it usually comes in two forms, one of two forms, okay? The first one is outright opposition. The enemy is going to attack you. Reminds me of my friend Brayden. My, I met Brayden when he was a, uh, after his sophomore year of high school. I was his student pastor, and I got to know him. Brayden is this incredible young man. He um, was a a, a great baseball athlete. He, he played in the band. Incredibly smart. Uh, just a, a great guy to be around. Incredible guy. I got to know him. I didn't really know a lot of his story, a lot of his background, but slowly I got to know him. And over time, I learned that at the beginning of his sophomore year, his mom had been given a terminal cancer diagnosis. He had uh, made a decision for Jesus. He wanted to be faithful, be a follower of Christ. And his mom was this incredible, godly woman, was mentoring young women in the community know Jesus, to be faithful, to be obedient followers of Christ, and, and, and so if anyone, if something bad would happen to anyone, you would not want it to happen to Brayden's mom. Sure enough, she got this diagnosis, and, and, and finally it, it became clear that there was going to be, uh, there was going to be no solution. She was going to die from this cancer, and so instead of having her die in the hospital, they brought her home, and she was in hospice and living in their house, and, and he said that every day of his sophomore year, be sitting in class. And you know how, you know how people would uh, come to the door during class, they knock on the door and they bring a note to the teacher and, you know, it'd be like, hey, you know, Susie, you need to go to the dentist or you need to go see this person or you have a pass to go do this. Braden said that every single time he thought he was getting the message that his mom had died. So he spent his sophomore year. I don't know what it's going to be for you. I don't know what the message of death will be in your world, in your life, in your youth group, in your community. But sometimes it comes in the form of outright opposition. And then other times, it's not. Other times, instead of this outright opposition where you're being attacked in some form or another, it's, it's a temptation. It's a seduction. It reminds me of my friend Jacob. He was at a CLI move. He uh, was graduated. He had graduated from high school. He was enrolled to go to the University of Illinois. He was going to be a business major. He was all excited about it. He's at this new conference, and he felt like God was calling him to ministry. As clear as day, he felt like, this is what I should do. I'm going to go home. I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to switch schools, or I'm going to figure out how to work my major at the U of I so that I can make sure I end up in ministry. And he was so excited about it. And then he got home, and he had a conversation with his parents, and his mom and dad said, uh, mm, are you sure about that, Jacob? I mean, I don't know if you know this, but, but ministers, they don't make a lot of money, Jacob. Jacob, are you sure? I mean, Jacob, are you sure that you really want to give your life to that? I mean, and he, he seemed so sure on the mountain. But then when the valley came, and it, it became a little more difficult to make that decision, he wasn't so committed. So I just, I got to tell you, just so you know, so you're ready for it, you're going to get a message of death. It'll come in the form of persecution. It'll come in the form of seduction. I don't know which it will be for you, but it's coming. The message of death is coming. And then verse 3, Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. Now, here's the thing you need to know. Beersheba is the southernmost city in the southern kingdom. He leaves the kingdom where Ahab is king, goes as far south as he can go in that kingdom, and then he goes even further south. He is wanting to get as far from Ahab and Jezebel as he possibly can. So he goes south of Beersheba to do it. And this is an interesting verse. In verse 3 it says, and he was afraid. There are two ways to translate this, that he was afraid. One is, as, this, as the text gets translated, and he was afraid. It, it makes me think of Moses. 
leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. And you've, they've seen these ten plagues. They've seen God do incredible thing after incredible thing after incredible thing. And they should know by now that their God has got them. Right? I mean, he's seen them bring fire from heaven. He's seen them bring plagues. He's seen them take care of the people of Israel over and over again. And now as they come out of Egypt, they're standing at the edge of the Red Sea. And behind them they see the army of the Egyptians and Pharaoh coming after them. And you would think, what would they do? Bring it on, our God's got this, right? But Exodus chapter 14 verse 10, as Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing them in great fear. The Israelites cried out to the Lord. They're afraid, and we think, why? Your God's got this, but when we get a message of death, sometimes we just get scared. They said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt? You've taken us out to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians, for it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. You, you believe the lie that serving Baal is better than the true life that God offers, because sometimes it does get hard. But Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Listen to this, church. Listen to this, students. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to keep still. God's got this. And so maybe Elijah flees because he is afraid. And maybe when you get that message of death, you're going to want to flee because But the other way you could translate this text, the other way you could translate verse 3, he was afraid, is not that he was afraid, but that he saw what happened. You see, sometimes it's not that Elijah is afraid, it's that after this mountaintop experience, he thought when he came down from the mountain and ran the 17 miles from Mount Carmel to the Jezreel Valley to go to the kingdom where Ahab was reigning, that this victory would change everything. He thought that the prophets of Baal would be destroyed and then the, there would be revival would break out and, and Jezebel would be cast up from the throne and everything would change and all of Israel would turn and start worshiping God. He thought from this one moment everything would be different when he got home and it wasn't. That's what he thought. And so as, as he looks and he sees Jezebel's still on the throne, I'm still getting messages of death, he doesn't fear, he is failure. It's not that he's scared that God can't, can, can't, God can't keep him safe. It's that he thinks, I have failed in the mission that God has given me. And sometimes you're going to feel that way. You're going to go home and you're going to go back to your same room, with your same parents, your same church, with the same issues in your youth group. And you're going to go, you know what, this is just, this, this is a failure. This mountaintop experience that I thought would change everything hasn't. And so Elijah thinks that he's a failure. And so from there, verse 4, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. And he asked that he might die. Why does he want to die? He wants to die because he thinks he's a failure, because he's afraid. It is enough now, O Lord, to take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. I I failed in this mission that you called me to, to reach my school, to reach my youth group, to do whatever it is that Jesus called you to do. I failed in it. And then he lay down under the broom tree, and he fell asleep. And suddenly an angel, a malach, shows up. You see, the messenger of death in verse 2 is replaced by a messenger of life, in verse 5, suddenly an angel, a, say it with me, mal touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him 
and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. When I was at the CLI Move Conference, this was years ago, and um, incredible message like you heard last night from Mark, and, and mountaintop experience, and I remember talking to Emily afterwards. She, she left after the, the session was over, and she was just in tears, and I, so I went to talk to her. I said, Emily, you know, what's going on? She said, I, I know that this is true. I, I know that that what he said or what she said on that stage was true. I know that God loves me. I know that he cares about me. I know that he's going to provide for me. I know he's going to fight for me. I know he's going to protect for me. I, I know those things are true because I've heard them, but I don't feel like they're true. And every morning I wake up and I just feel bad and I feel anxious and I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't understand. We sat there and we talked. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a, I'm not a counselor, and so oh, we just talked, and I listened, and, and she explained to me her feelings of depression. I, I, I didn't fully understand, but I knew that I loved her, that I cared about her as her pastor, and we talked about it, and she said, I just feel like God doesn't love me. I feel like he won't fight for me. I feel like it's never going to get any better. I feel like, well, she feels like she's getting a mess with death. And in that moment, I said, Emily, I understand that's how you feel, but it's not true. You see, God is going to place people in your lives that will be messengers of, of life. As you get these messages of death, as you deal with persecution, as you deal with seduction, God is placing people in your world that are going to give you messages of life. Listen to them. Because your feelings are wrong sometimes. Because you're hearing lies from people who don't know the truth. And what you need in those moments when you get messages and messages of death is to listen to the messenger of life. Your youth leader, your youth pastor, even, dare I say, your parents. Students, you will get messages of death, but in the midst of those messages of death, God will send messengers of life. And so why does, why does Elijah go to Horeb? Is it because he's afraid and he's trying to escape Ahab? Maybe. But I think it's more because he's angry about the failure and he wants to talk to God. You know, Horeb is an important place in the Old Testament. We think about the high point, the mountain of Mount Carmel, the other high point, the other mountain of the Old Testament is Horeb, Sinai, the place where God reveals the law to the people of Israel. In that story in the book of Exodus, when God comes on Mount Sinai, Moses goes up and he receives the law of God. And while he's there receiving the law, he hears this sound down in the camp. These people, Israel, that have been led out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of oppression, out of idolatry, into true life. And now they're in the valley and they're confused and saying, well, you know, it's been 40 days. I don't know where Moses went. You know what, Aaron? Make us a, a golden calf. Make us a God that we can worship who brought us out of Egypt. And, and Aaron makes a golden calf. And Moses hears this as he's up on a mountain. And he comes down in Exodus 32. And he is disgusted because the people, instead of holding on to the mountaintop, as soon as they get in the valley, they scatter and they're faithless. And there's this terrible reckoning that happens. And after that, in Exodus chapter 33, God says to Moses, Listen, Moses, you can go into Egypt. Uh, that's fine. Uh, or you can, you can leave Egypt. You can go into the land of Canaan. You can go into the land of flowing with milk and honey. You can go to the land of life that I have prepared for you. You can go there, uh, but I'm not going to go with you because I think if I went with you, I'd probably just kill you Israelites because you're so stiff-necked and disobedient. I, I can't deal with you anymore. And so Moses says, no, no God, I, I want to see your glory. I'm not leaving. If you don't go with us, God, I'm not going at all. And so he goes up on the mountain into a cave on Mount Horeb and sees the glory of the Lord pass by. In 1 Kings 19, at that place, he came to a cave. It says a cave, but it should say the cave. This is the cave. 
Elijah goes to Mount Horeb. He goes to the mountain. He goes to the cave because he knows that in the cave he is going to have an encounter with the one true God. He doesn't go, I think, because he's afraid. He goes because he feels like a failure and he wants God to explain. I thought I was doing all the stuff you wanted me to do. Why is it still this hard? This last year, um, this last year I ran a marathon, and uh, it was a great experience, and I, you know, I felt like pretty good about, no, don't clap, please don't. I, I felt pretty good about myself until I met my friend Rob, who ran a 100-mile foot race called the Western States 100. And I thought, I, I ran a marathon, and I felt like, okay, I've accomplished something, and also I want to die now. I don't want to do that again. But there's this thing called ultra running, where people run these 100-mile foot races, and uh, you, they do it through the mountains and through these trails and through these streams. And one of the things that ultra runners often talk about is this thing called the pain cave. Because after you run for so long, your body just starts to kind of break down and, and all the lactic acid that builds up in your muscles from, from running and, or from activity. You know how after you, you do a hard workout the next day you're sore? That's the lactic acid in your muscles is what makes you sore. And what happens is when you run, because you're basically running for 24 hours straight, when you do that, you, that lactic acid just starts to saturate your muscles, and so everything hurts constantly. My friend Rob told me that um, after a while, after the first, like, 12 hours of running, he's running in the middle of the night, and uh, he's still trying to stay on his feet, he realized, oh, it, everything hurts. So he could speed up running because he realized it didn't matter if he was going slow or if he was going fast, it was going to hurt no matter what. And ultra runners call this the pain cave. And they talk about the pain cave as this place where you go, and when you're in that pain and when you're in that difficulty, there's this clarity of thought, this clarity of expression, this moment of, dare I say, revelation. Students, you will get messages of death. And I pray that in those moments you listen to messengers of life. But in your pain, in your cave, turn to the one true God and see that he can fight for you, that he will fight for you, that he cares about you, that he loves you, and that even though right now it seems like nothing is going right, you have a God who brings fire from heaven. You have a God who parts seas. You have a God who raises the dead. 